In this episode of Idea City. So here I am at 40 years of age and I made it here. I put my hands in the Red Sea after crossing all of Africa. I'm squeezing this cell full in disbelief that I made it here on these two feet. Because as I stand here talking to you guys today, I started running a little over five years ago. That's how long I've been doing this. A couple of years before that, I was smoking a pack a day sometimes too. And the biggest adventure I'd set out on was finding the best deal on happy hour I could. Idea City, the smartest people, the biggest ideas. At age 31, which was not all that long ago, Ray Zahab smoked uh, one pack a day and sometimes two. And I'm not talking about marijuana or anything easy like, but killer tobacco. More recently, he ran across the Sahara. I mean, anybody can run across the Sahara, but... <laughs> he did it in 111 days. This is amazing. If you calculate 7,400 kilometers and 111 days, you discover that he ran the equivalent of two marathons a day without a break. So that's four months straight, day after day after day, in temperatures that routinely soared over 50 degrees Celsius. I felt we had to meet this madman <laughs> and ask just what does it take <laughs> to run without end in those punishing circumstances and more importantly, what motivated you to do it? Reza. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sir, what an honor this is. Thank you. Thank you so much. What an honor it is to be here today speaking on this stage. I mean, this is amazing. It's Idea City. Is this not totally awesome? Is it? And the weather today is absolutely gorgeous. The sky's opened up. The sun's out. It's warm, which I can promise you is in stark contrast to where I was just a few months ago. That, my friends, is the geographic South Pole, the top of the bottom of the world. I stood there with two of my teammates after trekking and skiing 1,100 kilometers for a little less than 34 days from Hercules Inlet to the geographic South Pole, unsupported. Now I say trekked and skied, because you see, my teammates are the smart ones. They chose to ski. They're very good at it. I chose to use snowshoes. I can't ski. The good thing was about that is I became the first person in history to make this journey over these 1,100 plus kilometers, solely on foot without the use of skis. So sometimes you make the right decisions, right? But I'm asked all the time, thank you, I'm asked all the time by friends, what is this unsupported, what does it mean to trek to the South Pole? What's it like? Well, imagine tying a sled around your waist, and in that sled is 170 pounds of gear and food, everything you need to survive on the Antarctic continent, temperatures minus 40. The South Pole, of course, is at 10,000 feet. So you're gonna go uphill the entire time. And you got all kinds of hazards in your way, like these deep crevasses, these cracks in the ice, where there's a precarious snow bridge on them, and you're gonna cross them, and perhaps it may give way dragging you, your sled, your teammates, everything into the abyss never to be seen again. That's what it's like. Now, yeah. Sounds incredible, but I'll tell you what was more incredible to the three of us as we made our way just a few months ago to the South Pole. What was incredible to us is that we were not alone three trekkers and skiers making it to the South Pole. No, we were three plus thousands. Because you see, thousands of young people from all over North America tracked our daily progress, followed us, became active team members in our expedition by asking us questions through a live website we created. They'd ask us the questions, we'd answer the questions with voice files and sat phones every day. Total inclusion on this website we called South Pole Quest. This not-for-profit organization we started, Impossible to Possible, hosted this expedition so that we would be able to share the experience with these students around the world. And I'll be perfectly honest with you, we wouldn't have broke the world record, which indeed we did by over five days for unsupported to the South Pole, if it wasn't for these young people inspiring us every single day. It was incredible. They were our motor to get there. Now, how do you come up with the idea for something like this? You know, 
Impossible to possible and the South Pole quest didn't start at Hercules Inlet when the expedition started. Actually, the idea came to me a few years ago. A few years ago when two other buddies of mine and I were running across Africa. Now, <laughs> hard to believe unless you get to see it. Fortunately, we had a documentary film crew following our entire expedition, and so you're able to see a little bit of it right here. It is the most unforgiving place on Earth. Over 3.5 million square miles. A vast wilderness. It is the Sahara Desert, with people and cultures as unpredictable as the landscape. Running 50 miles a day, it's the challenge, it's going the distance, it's just pushing myself to my limits. It's never been done. No one's ever run that far in that period of time. That will be tough. It's a mental thing, I think. Imagine running 50 miles per day for more than 100 days. In an unprecedented personal challenge, three ultra runners, good friends, test physical strength and mental toughness running across the entire Sahara Desert. They're such high-end athletes. They're used to pushing themselves, but they're going to be pushing their bodies more than they ever have in the past. We've had injury. We've had sickness. Sorry, dude. The best thing to do would be to stop for the day, but we have to cover some miles today. Any Americans found there without proper paperwork are going to be considered spies, liable to execution. Well, we're going to have to make the best decision for us as a team. It's so difficult for me because the personalities are so different. I don't want to push us into the ground, obviously, but I'll push us damn close. This is, you know, a lot tougher than you could have ever thought. You can do this. You don't want to quit. It's okay. <laughs> we saw a young boy, seven or eight years old, in the desert alone, fending for himself while his dad was a two days walk away to get water. That's the water situation. I mean, it's so much bigger an issue than I would have ever thought. Narrated by executive producer Matt Damon and directed by James Mall, a personal and compelling journey into the world's most mysterious wilderness. The purpose of the three of us coming here was to learn more about each other, to learn about the people of the Sahara, and to do something that hasn't been done before. They all three agreed that if one runner went down, they would be out of the expedition. I thought your commitment was different than that. When is the end? The end is when we get to Cairo. It will be a life-changing experience, and not just for the three runners, for everybody who's along on this journey. When we come back... They don't have any dreams and they don't have any hopes because they don't go to school. They don't get an education because they spend their days walking to get clean drinking water. These were the things that we were learning. Yes, we knew and we're learning about how serious the water issues were, but that it was affecting these young people the most in this way was just too much. Get the latest Idealist news, presenter information, and watch streaming video at www.ideacityonline.com. Idea City, the smartest people, the biggest ideas. It took, took Charlie, Kevin, and I 111 days to run the 7,500 kilometers between the west coast of Africa and the east coast of Africa through the Sahara Desert. That's like running from St. John's, Newfoundland to Vancouver in the sand when it's plus 50 out. I mean, you know, 70 kilometers a day was the average. We never took a single day of rest, but possibly one of the most difficult things of this expedition was that we had two showers the entire time we were out there. So if our support crew couldn't see us coming in a sandstorm, we weren't going to get lost because they sure as hell could smell us. That much I can promise you. But you know, this expedition would become so much more than a run, than a first, than a physical achievement or a mental achievement. We were going to learn something so critical that it would change all of our paths. We just didn't know it yet. We just didn't know it yet. This man, Mohamed Iksa, a hero to me is a hero among his people, the Tuareg, the Niger and Mali. Mohammed has done more for his people in Niger and Mali than just about everyone. He has brought education to remote communities. He has provided employment with a guiding company he has started. 
Mohammed would be our expedition leader. He would lead us across the Sahara. He would negotiate thousands of kilometers of sand dunes for us, mountains, areas on maps that, that don't even exist on the maps that we have. And talk about dangerous areas of the Sahara, conflict. When you're rolling with Mohammed, it's like rolling with the Sopranos in New Jersey. You've got nothing to worry about out there. You're in good hands. Now, 111 days in the Sahara, we had a plan. It would have to work like this. We would leave, of course, from this small camp every day. We would run 12, 15, 17 hours every single day and then rejoin camp the end of each day. Physically, of course, unbelievably difficult. That I can assure you. Injuries, every single injury you can possibly imagine from running, I had. I remember the doctor who volunteered for our team coming to me one day and saying, Ray, tell me what part of you is the most sore. I said, well, Doc, you see this patch above my left eyebrow? I said, yeah. I said, that's the only spot that doesn't hurt. I mean, you know, physically very difficult, but what I like to tell people is the physical part of this is 90% mental, the other 10% is all in our heads. You're going to know that you're going to get out there and you're going to suffer. It's going to happen. You got to wrap your head around it, embrace it, and keep moving. But there was one part of this expedition that was almost unembraceable and unmanageable. That was the emotional, the emotional part of this expedition. How difficult it was for me to be away from not just family, but my wife. I cannot tell you how difficult, as corny as that sounds, how difficult it was for me to be away from this person who I share everything with in my life. There was an emotional gap created that was very hard to overcome. Very, very difficult. The things we take for granted, right? I was learning already. Now, something extraordinary. We would go through these communities in Mali and Niger for resupply. And every single time we'd be greeted by these smiling, beautiful faces. These friendly faces who had no idea we were coming to their community. Yet they would greet us with open arms and be so happy to run with us, so joyous. The laughter, I'm telling you guys, it was incredible. It was palpable. It would temporarily replace that emotional crater. Fill it in. It was amazing. The feeling that these people, these people, I mean, in these communities, these remote communities, let me tell you something. Economically, Compared to us, we would say, some of us, they have nothing. But I was learning every single day. These people, in some ways, have so much more. Socially, in these communities, the most well-adjusted people I'd ever met. Happy, generous, takes a village to raise a child. These people live in it, right? True story. We would come to these communities. We would come to these communities. They would worry and fear for our safety, that we may not make it to the next community because it's so far away, they would feed us the food from their mouths to care for us. It was incredible generosity on a, a scale that I've never seen. But we were learning, as I say, and constantly learning on this journey. We were learning about how serious the water crisis was in northern Africa. Now, without getting into it too deeply, because simply time does not permit, I can assure you of this. In these communities where water access, clean, access to clean drinking water is not readily available, the stories, the things that we were learning about from the most base level, case in point, we go running into a community that does not have a well, a clean well. Water is very far away. And you get down, we talk to these kids in every community. What do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be? Blank stares looking at you. Because they don't have any dreams and they don't have any hopes because they don't go to school. They don't get an education because they spend their days walking to get clean drinking water. These were the things that we were learning. Yes, we knew and we're learning about how serious the water issues were, but that it was affecting these young people the most in this way was just too much. When we come back. You know, as my wife would say and has said so eloquently, nobody is going to go and see a documentary film called Running Parts of the Sahara. You guys got to get to the Red Sea so that you could tell these stories of what you learned. Get the latest Idea City news instantly. Follow us on Twitter. Idea City, the smartest people, the biggest ideas. The motivation and the shift and the reasons for why we were running was changing. As Mohammed says, the, the Tuareg people and the people of this area of this era, their lives are turned upside down because of this, and a whole host of other issues. I mean, people are leaving the nomads. The nomads in our time are, are disappearing. They're disappearing because they come into these communities looking for water, there's no water, you know? The people from these small communities, they're dis disintegrating, they're moving into these larger urban centers where you're seeing whole hosts of other issues, like violent crime increasing in Agadez, the largest urban center in Africa, AIDS on the rise, all attributable to the water crisis. My wife took this photograph. Take a look at the bottom, I gotta use the laser. Look at the bottom. That's a truck. That's a community. 
That's a community 100 miles outside Agatha is coming in. They want a better life for their kids, right? It was amazing. The evolution had taken place to why we were running and why we wanted to get to the Red Sea. We hit the Tenerife, a section of thousands of kilometers of nothing but sand dunes. And as we ran, we told each other, we spoke to each other many times, numerous times during the day, turned the iPods off and talked about what we had learned, the three of us running together, that this had become something so different. You know, as my wife would say, and has said so eloquently, nobody is going to go and see a documentary film called Running Parts of the Sahara. You guys got to get to the Red Sea so that you can tell these stories of what you learned. And we burned it. I mean, we were burning it. Some days were 100K days, and we were cranking up. We turned north towards Libya. 21 days of sandstorms. 21 days of winds upwards of 160 kilometer hour gusting, 60K sustained. I went in there. Looking like I do now, I came out looking like I was 12 years old from involuntary exfoliation. But that wind, that wind, that wind did not slow us down. No, sir, the eyes were on Egypt and getting there. And when Egypt, when we were at Egypt's door, it was like we were three wild horses chasing that barn wide open with oats. It was unbelievable, the experience of feeling so powerful that the impossible was truly going to become possible. We were going to get to this Red Sea to tell these stories. Well... City of 16 million people, we round the bend, you know, the 100 kilometer bend to the pyramids, turn our backs towards Cairo, and as quickly as you're seeing these photographs, it happened. The Red Sea was in front of us. Now, I left a different person than I entered the Sahara. And I went home, my wife and I, and we pledged to one another that we were going to make a difference. Try our very best to make a difference in the lives of children that are affected by social and environmental issues, and not just young people in Africa all around the world. I mean, look at at home, case in point, our First Nations, some of the water is the same quality as what I was seeing in Niger. Boom. We came home, we joined the board of directors of the Ryan's Wall Foundation, we volunteered with other organizations, but there was still something, something more that Kathy and I wanted to do. We met with a group of friends of ours and we said, hey, let's start this organization impossible to possible. Because I'd made a deal with myself when I put my hands in the Red Sea. I was never taking another step again if it was not gonna be used in some way to raise awareness, find funding solutions, do something positive. Kathy said, all right, let's leverage those expeditions. Let's use them in a way, let's build them, let's make them a platform, not only to educate and inspire a whole generation of young people in countries like Canada and developed countries that they have the keys and the power to change the world, but that these kids are going to shape our future. These are our future leaders. Let's take them on these incredible adventures. Let's bring them with us the best way that we can, virtually. And beyond that, we'll bring them with us en route on the expeditions. But let's do this. So we brought them with us to the South Pole. And there I am, standing at the South Pole, with my hands wrapped around it just a few months ago. And I don't want to let go, you know, because I'm in disbelief that here I am, at 40 years of age, and I made it here. I put my hands in the Red Sea after crossing all of Africa. I'm squeezing this South Pole in disbelief that I made it here on these two feet, because as I stand here talking to you guys today, I started running a little over five years ago. That's how long I've been doing this. A couple of years before that, I was smoking a pack a day sometimes too, and the biggest adventure I'd set out on was finding the best deal on happy hour I could. I mean, that's what I, I was Mr. Sedentary. But here I am, I did this. I proved, I'm living proof that we can do anything we set our minds to. You know, the only barriers we have are the ones we put on ourselves. That's what this journey taught me, you know? I know this at 40, within every fiber of myself, that we as human beings can do anything we set our minds and our hearts to. I'm 40, can you imagine being 13 and being freed from all boundaries? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Ray. Thank you. Woo. <laughs> Thanks, Ray. I want to ask you Thank some you. questions. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Crocs. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Not, I'm not as well dressed as you know, yeah, you yeah. a million bucks. Here I am. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Um, I want to know about the knees. The knees? How are the knees? The, knock on wood. Really? You know, knock on wood. No problems Everything's whatsoever. Okay so far. Meniscus is good. You know? Whatever miles I got left in these legs, they're going to get used up. Uh -huh. So when it's done, it's done. 
I want to know about his regime. Do you want to know about his health regime? Like, do you eat anything in particular? Do you do anything unusual? Are you... You know, uh, as, as one of my buddies who ran across the Sahara said to me one day, you know, one of the reasons I run is so that I can eat just about anything I... You know, you gotta... Food is life, right? You know, we love the... Mm. And the other reason I run is so that I can stop. Mm. You know? <laughs> Get lots of rest. Really. I see. <laughs> it belongs to that class of thing which feels great when you stop. Sort of like banging your head against the wall. One of those kind of things. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Thanks. Thank you so much. You Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank so you, again. you eat meat? You do all of that stuff? Hmm? You eat meat? I eat, uh, you know what? I eat very healthy. I, may, I make light, but I do eat very healthy and... Uh, you know, my wife, she, she's, she's incredible. She's, you know, she monitors what comes into the house. And, and uh, you know, we, we try to eat organic when we can. We, you know what we're really down with these days is the whole 100-mile thing. Uh -huh. We are all over that now, you know, more than anything. We love that. We live in Chelsea, Quebec. You know, there's all kinds of great farmers in the area. It's awesome. How do you it's feel great. about hypervitamins? Do you believe in that? I, I, take, a lot of, I take a lot of vitamins you do. and various supplements, so... Yeah, right. I think there's something to it, for sure. Okay. We're learning things every day, aren't we? I mean, yeah. it's incredible. Yeah. And the things that we said were science fiction five years ago are now science, so. Last question. Six years ago, you were a hedonistic bum. Mm. What, what motivated that change? What was the epiphany? What, what happened? Truly? Yeah. I'm tired of feeling sorry for myself. It's the worst thing you can do is feel sorry for yourself because there's always somebody else guaranteed that's got it worse than you do. Mm -hmm. And it was the realization that I really wasn't doing anything with my life, and we have one life. We have one life on this planet, and what we do with it, success is not measured by how much money we die, you know, we die and how much money we got in our bank account. It's what we do with our lives. How many lives can we affect in a positive way? I didn't know at the time that that's what my destiny would be, but I did know that this one life that I did have was a hell of a lot more valuable than the way I was treating it. That's it. All right. Well Thanks, done. folks. Thank you very much. You're an inspiration. What did you think of the audience's reaction? I love it audience was is amazing you know when you have an audience like that that you can speak to and they collectively uh you know reciprocate um what better feeling in the world is than that